Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am unfortunately not in Plainfield. I'm in uh, Texas, but uh, as uh, uh, Sarah has indicated, I have a a, a, a great uh, history uh, from uh, from New Jersey. The uh, a, a little about four years ago, I began to work like a scout. Uh, going on reconnaissance missions into the New Jersey landscape uh, that uh, obviously doesn't appear ancient today, camouflaged as it is by all the urban development uh, and, and parks and roadside graveyards. But I found my ancestors and independent proof of their involvement in these stirring events that you're going to hear about today. These events have always been kept alive in the traditions of uh, my, my distant family. The witty humorous Mark Twain is believed to have said, why waste your money on looking up your family tree? Just go into politics and your opponents will do it for you. I don't believe that looking up one's family tree uh, is uh, a waste of time or money, but entering politics is not an option. Besides, politics is fleeting and families are forever. Family history is part of our identity. The more we understand history and our heritage, the more we understand ourselves. I personally think it's gratifying to know something of the people to which we belong, even if it was long ago and our connections are tenuous, especially when they played important roles in European and American history. Many people realize that we're all just stories in the end, so we're hoping to make and find some good ones in our family tree. While we may live in interesting times, we might discover that one's ancestors uh, were pioneers or patriots that helped win a war in theirs. Most people have only fragmentary records of what happened in their ancestral families. And when past generations die, a library disappears forever. Sometimes the scarcity of surviving records leads individuals and their families to believe their family stories shouldn't be considered history. As uh, many of you know, genealogy is now one of the top hobbies in America. Uh, with the advent of digitization of census recordings, birth, marriage, death certificates, and other government docs, excuse me, documents, grave markers, local newspaper source materials, and, and as well as genetic genealogy through Y or MT DNA uh, uh, testing, it's now easier to establish relationships between individuals to determine genetic and, and ethnic origins. I am luckier than most because there's a treasure trove of written materials and no shortage of these census records to tie me to the Vermouls in America and even as far back as the 16th century in Europe. I think part of the reason we love genealogy is that our heritage is a kingdom that no one else can reclaim. It's also a way to wedge ourselves into history. Along this genealogical and historic history journey, I made some good friends and gained some committed collaborators uh, with a passion for local history and uncovering evidence. People like Rich Palmatier, uh, a cartographer. Uh, Rich works for the Union County and he's the resident expert on Robert Erskine, who was George Washington's map maker in the early days of the war. Also, as uh, uh, Nancy Piwawar, who is on the call here with us today, I think Rich is as well. Uh, you know, uh, Nancy, I met when I gave this presentation for the first time at the Mule Mansion Fleetwood Camera Museum three years ago. Uh, Nancy, uh, as you know, is with the Plainfield Historical Society in Drake House. She's one of the hardest working and passionate local history people I know. Her enthusiasm is intoxicating. She kept the history fires burning during the pandemic and spearheaded the effort to engage local New Jersey academic institutions in our quest to find the lost fort. These ac academic institutions are cobbling together fragmented, scarce and coarse data. They are actively receiving and seeking grant dollars for support and finding the fort using modern surveying equipment applying the theories of evidence and procedures of real boundary reconstruction to identify where the Ford installation may have been. One of the institutions is the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Uh, they have constructed a digital base map of the oldest available maps of the area using CAD and GIS type database with overlay features. Rich Palmatier has done much of his own mapping and overlaying using the Robert Erskine maps. Later this year, he will be presenting to this same group through the library uh, and he, reporting his findings thus far. At the end of this, as Sarah mentioned, Nancy will potentially show us a overlay of where we think the fort was. 
Uh, we are in preliminary discussions to establish a Lost Fork Foundation, 501c3, to raise dollars to help us locate the fork. I also want to give a shout out to Greenbrook and Somerset County Historical Societies that have been uh, open arms uh, of support and uh, friendship uh, on, this, uh, on this journey. The uh, progenitor of the Vermeule family uh, in America, Adrian Vermeule, came to New York in 1693, settling in Harlem, then very much a separate village from the rest of Manhattan. He became a respected church elder and Vorlesser in Dutch Reformed Church, now Elmendorf, still there today on 121st Street in Harlem. He also became the town clerk of Harlem. He later moved to the Raritan Landing in 1706, where he served his community as a prominent elder of the Raritan Dutch Reformed Church, now Somerville. He married Mary Marcellus. If you look here at the map uh, up here in the northwest corner, you can see the Marcellus family uh, location, and uh, he married uh, his neighbor's daughter. Um, he, uh, is, he served his community as a prominent elder of the uh, uh, Somerville Reformed Church. He married Mary. They had seven children, one of whom was Cornelius Vermeule Jr., my five times great-grandfather, who was born in Bergen in 1716. The family had a long history of defying control by the Catholic Church Span and Spanish kings during the Dutch Revolt. Adrian's ancestor served in the court of William of Orange as ambassador to Denmark. He was a very successful merchant in that era. The Dutch Navy, as you may recall from your history, ruled the seas in the 17th century, um, much to the dismay of England. At the time of his, uh, Adrian's move to the Raritan Valley, Somerset County had 4,500 inhabitants of whom 90% were Dutch. East Jersey as a whole had about 26,000 residents of who fully one quarter were Dutch. At the time, the average amount of improved land per family in the Dutch counties of Bergen and Somerset in the Raritan Valley was 80 acres, and in the English county of Essex, only 35 acres. Before he died in 1736, Adrian Vermeule purchased the plantation. The 1200 acre farm was the largest plantation in the area. You can see here in this map, the gray shaded area with the dots. This is the uh, boundary of the fork. Now, Levi, the Lennox farm hat, hat was uh, a, a barrier, I guess you could say, to the militia post. You can see the militia post in here. You can see the Stony Brook uh, and, the, and the Green River and the two mills that were on the fort, and then Frederick and Cornelius Vermeule um, as, as the main uh, owners of the, uh, of the location. The 1,200-acre the, uh, the farm was the largest in the area, uh, reaching from the first ridge on the Watchung mountaintop, which is up here where Washington Rock is, far across North Plainfield. If you go down from the ridge down into North Plainfield to right here on the border, this is about 8th Street uh, in North Plainfield. Plainfield was the plain fields of the West Fields of Elizabethtown. In various deeds and wills, the southeasternmost part of the plantation was considered to be in Elizabethtown. The land was coveted by the English, and the Vermules were well-known inhabitants. Today, it comprises much of Greenbrook Park in North Plainfield. And New Jersey was a, a land of economic opportunity with rich farmland and pasture land. And since 1736, Cornelius lived and prospered on the Blue Hills Plantation. At the outbreak of the Revolutionary War, he was the prominent patriot in the region of Quibbletown, which is new, which was is New Market, which is now a section of Piscataway. Quibbletown was the name applied uh, uh, for the uh, uh, area. Uh, and, and in the time of social safety, a few social safety nets, a plantation owner's main concern was the support and maintenance of the family by whatever means necessary. So many of these plantations were worked by father and several sons, each with his own home and family. Usually these large Dutch farms had six to eight slaves apiece. Um, and uh, it, uh, Adrian Vermeule's four uh, young son, he had seven children, four young sons and three daughters. 
Two of the daughters died before the outbreak of the Revolutionary War. Each of the boys built their homesteads and later added big, big Dutch barns. Here you see, this is Rock Avenue today. Uh, it's listed here, uh, A, there's a, there's a uh, list of some of the streets here. Oops, sorry about that, down the, at the bottom. You can see here Adrian V. Vermeule, uh, in, and this was his home here on Rock Avenue in 1770 that's no, no, no longer there. This is the home of Captain Cornelius Jr. on West End or West View Avenue. And that house has been modified dramatically, but it is still there to this day. This is the home of Ida Vermeil. The four sons were Adrian, uh, Cornelius Jr., Frederick, and uh, Ida. And this is the home of Ida Vermeil. Uh, and in this sort of T-shaped of the of the property, and this is Front Street uh, today. And now at the time, the the road had a major bend in it, which was eventually straightened out uh, ac across here uh, to make room for the railroad uh, that came in uh, in the 1820s, 1830s. So, um, at the time of the the um, the land, okay, so at the time of few social safety nets, the plantation owner's main concern was support and maintenance of the family by whatever means necessary. So this uh, house right here, this was Frederick. This is uh, what we think is, Green, this is Greenbrook Road right here today and where the Vermeule Mansion and Fleetwood Camera Museum is today. This is on Greenbrook Road. This is the home built in 1736. I think uh, Frederick moved in in uh, 1740, and that house still exists today. Uh, and uh, it was no, it was known as a stagecoach uh, house. So um, it it may have been a postal stop as a stagecoach house. Um, and Cornelius and Frederick named their homestead the Blue Hills Plantation because of the beautiful blue haze that still settles on the Watchung Mountains. An Erskine map uh, uh, that Rich will show you someday uh, shows uh, the Widow Van Mulen home where Adrian and her lived. Adrian was captured in, uh, as a spy. Uh, working for the Committee of Safety underneath his father. More on that later. The large plantation produced almost everything needed by foragers and raiders. There were vast resources of grain and forage, slaves, oxen, cattle, horses, wagons, and there were two mills on the Greenbrook River that furnished flour and feed and sawed lumber, forest logs, and firewood. You can see here the two mill ponds. Or excuse me, that's not on the property. This one right here and this one, these two. Only six months after signing the Declaration of Independence, uh, after defeats in New York, Washington evacuated New York and crossed the Hudson, retreating to enemy country, New Jersey, to the Delaware River in the Raritan Valley and the Watchung Mountains, then known as the Blue Hills. The Watchung Ridges provided layers of protection that stretched for over 40 miles from Mawa to Somerset County. They formed a natural barrier that made New Jersey a fortress. Watchung's Valley Road was part of the safe route that linked New England with the southern states. The Great Retreat was mainly through the counties of Bergen, Essex, Eastern Somerset, and Middlesex, New Jersey. It was full of loyalists to the crown. So what, in, it, what Washington sometimes talked about was it really became a civil war neighbor sheathing sword at a neighbor. When Washington reached New Brunswick in November 1776, then Governor William Livingston ordered many of the New Jersey militia, including Colonel William Wins of Morris County to proceed, proceed up to the Blue Hills Plantation to protect the country from the plundering bands of enemy foragers. Colonel Wins knew that Cornelius Vermeule's patriotism could be relied upon from his own time serving in the Provincial Congress in 1776 along Frederick Freeland, alongside Frederick Freelingheiser. Every resource of the plantation and of the Blue Hills from Scotch Plains to Quibbletown and horses, cattle, and material was drawn upon. There are several historical or iterative markers on poles or street signs reminding us of the great retreat to victory to Pennsylvania through New Jersey's Watchung Mountains or Blue Hills, as they were once called, or Blondin Plains uh, by the local Lenape uh, Indians. 
The war in New Jersey was mainly fought by avoiding or distracting the British, leveraging the nearby New Jersey Blue Hills or Fortress Watchung, as one historian called it. It was in the Blue Hills that these long ago, these long gone troops, including my ancestors, marched, skirmished, and fought the British to a standstill in New Jersey, starting from the Delaware River, which George Washington famously crossed. So <clears throat> Somerset County, uh, excuse me, the Somerset Com Committee was very active in organizing for the struggle and was the hub of dissent in New Jersey. Some of the earliest movements of the Patriots in the revolution, as well as some of the darkest days which follow are associated with New Brunswick and the Raritan Valley. Here are the first meetings of the General Committee of Safety and Correspondence and of the Provincial Congress took place. The first General Committee of correspondents that met at New Brunswick expressed strong sympathy with Boston and agreed to collect money for the relief of Boston, which was under siege. The province approached the struggle with unhurried precision. They were largely church elders, clergymen, devout Christians. They knew full well the terrors of war. However, they were at first reluctant warriors, not quite ready to fully break from His Majesty King George III. After the Battle of Lexington and Concord in April of 1775, a second New Jersey Congress was assembled in May of that year. However, the province again reaffirmed its allegiance to the crown, even though the inevitability of a clash was in the air. It wasn't until the, after the Battle of Bunker Hill in June of 1775 that this same body reassembled in August of 1775 and chose new leaders. New committee deputies were chosen on the basis that they could truly manage a real crisis and fully govern New Jersey in wartime. One such deputy was my five times great grandfather, uh, the, the church elder of the Dutch Reformed Church in Somerville, Cornelius from Rule. He was 59 at the time. And so he was too old to actually serve in the military, but he was the kind of person the Patriot cause needed. He was elected one of the three members of the Somerset Committee of Safety and Correspondence and a member of the Provincial Congress in Trenton uh, at the October 3rd uh, Delegate Assembly. The province was now a true governing body exercising sovereign powers, including raising taxes for defense, calling out the militia and levying war. I don't know how many of you here today watched the Star's uh, uh, history show Outlander, but the main protagonists are currently dealing with the North Carolina Committee of Safety and Correspondence right now, not in a good way, frankly. <laughs> the uh, committee was in session and, and from that October, a grueling 21 days meeting continuously, except on Sundays. His, the local New Jersey historian, Charles Deschler, um, and uh, wrote in the incidents in the New Jersey Historical Society in 1849 that uh, about uh, the, the meetings that took place. One year later, uh, in 1776, the day of reckoning came and the storm clouds burst and the war was thrust upon the quiet, charming and prosperous Raritan Valley. Colonials having the gall to govern themselves in the name of the people were particularly in the British crosshairs. No patriots suffered more severely than those who served on these committees of safety and correspondence or as members of the Provincial or Continental Congress. Cornelius Vermeule, his immediate and allied families and friends, fellow members of the Provincial Congress and Committee of Safety uh, and correspondence were increasingly at risk. The family would not be easy to apprehend, however, because of the strong and well-hidden militia post on their plantation. However, they were in the hurricane's eye. These provincial and local congresses and committees were the start of revolutionary governments within the individual colonies, just as the Continental Congress was the beginning of uh, the Congress on a national scale. The uh, popular conception uh, of the Revolutionary War is that it consisted of only a few famous big battles and campaigns taught in the history books. The forage conflict in New Jersey proves that the war was a composite of numerous actions. There were, 13, there were over 1,300 military engagements in the war throughout the colonies. In New Jersey alone, there were at least 500 separate military incidents. Some historians call this the forage war to allow for prosecution of military campaigns elsewhere. Skirmishes went hand in 
hand to prevent redcoat foraging led by the New Jersey militia. These skirmishes are lesser known than the larger battles. However, they sometimes as involved as many men as the larger well-known battles and they were equally important. A byproduct of this, of this skirmishing uh, was foraging and plundering. Hessian soldiers and Tory mercenaries were foraging, raiding and ransacking prosperous farmers and merchants, including Somerset and Middlesex counties and the Raritan Valley. Everything was stripped. The Hessians and Tories were burning entire towns and farms, including six Dutch reformed and Presbyterian churches, which were symbols of radical patriotism. They plundered and burned as far west as Millstone and Boundbrook, north nearly to Plainfield and east to Amboy. Within a little over six months, they looted and trashed 650 homes and 100 buildings, including the mills. Raritan Landing was wiped out. Nearly everyone from there was in the New Jersey Middlesex militia, and this was their punishment. Out of the 69 members from Middlesex and the Provincial Congress, 43 had their homes and buildings burned or looted. The enemy occupied this territory and wreaked terrible vengeance on the Patriots. Fully one third of the families in Middlesex County were driven from their homes, suffering in that bitter cold of that hard winter of 1776 and 77. Hundreds were seized, carried off, and starved to death in the foul sugar house prisons of New York City, including uh, Cornelius's eldest son, Adrian, who served in the Committee of Observation for his father. He was caught spying on loyalists near New Brunswick in early January 1777 while changing mounts at his wife's cousin's farm. This was a map produced by my distant cousin Cornelius uh, C. Vermool, who was a, a, a local engineer. <laughs> Um, and uh, th this map he produced in the early 1900s. As I mentioned earlier, Quibbletown, which is now Newmarket, is a sec, you can see here down with my arrows pointing to, this is Quibbletown, which is now Newmarket at section of Piscataway. There's the Newmarket Pond, or I think Middlesex Pond uh, down here that uh, had many mills on or a few mills on it, which is obviously still there today. This, this, new, this Quibble Town is a township that existed since 1666. And as I said earlier, it was a name applied in a general way to the country for several miles around it since there were no existing towns uh, nearer than Scotch Plains to the east up here and Boundbrook to the west. When Colonel William Wentz came to the Vermeule Plantation just below the first bridge, of the Wachung right here. Here's Washington Rock and here is the Vermool headquarters. This was the Vermool homestead right here, which became Wenz's headquarters, which Washington visited frequently. There was a Lenape path that came down out of the uh, Wachung from Washington Rock, uh, which is about four or 500 feet above sea level. And he would walk the path down to meet with Wins and his uh, and his officers at the Vermeul uh, Mansion. He also had other meetings at uh, with his officers, including with Alexander Hamilton and others at the Drake House, not too far away, right up here. Not far, maybe a mile or so from the uh, militia post. So when he came uh, and the, during the Great Retreat uh, to meet with Vermeul. Cornelius gladly allowed the construction of a 95 acre militia post and 200 yards square fort. 200 yards square, I've learned from Rich Palmetter, means approximately 600 yards on each side of the fort. So it was a pretty substantial uh, fort. And that is, began the Quibbletown encampment. And that's what Washington himself called it uh, in various letters, including to General Israel Putnam in June 26, 1777. <laughs> My three times great grandmother, Judith Ramul Phillips, was a granddaughter of Cornelius. She was born on the Blue Hills and she wrote in a letter to uh, Cornelius C. Ramul, who produced this map in later years around 1870, that she remembers seeing remnants of the old fort as a child growing up on the plantation. The encampment, right in here, was built along the east bank of the Greenbrook between what is now Clinton and West End Avenues in North Plainfield. The location of the post had significant military importance as it was on the direct route from New Brunswick down here uh, to Morristown up through here. 
uh, midway between the two hostile armies and camped at both locations. It was key to protecting General Washington's southern flank. The post was naturally guarded on the west and north by steep bluff along the Greenbrook Meadows uh, and needed earthworks only on the south and east. At the base of the bluff, there were several clear springs, ample to supply a large garrison with wholesome water. The gravely uh, soil afforded excellent sanitary conditions as well. Cornelius' son, Eider, operated the flour mill just east of the and adjacent to the post along the Greenbrook. The fort guarded the main road, which is the old King's Highway from Scotch Plains to Quibbletown, which is present day Front Street and North Plainfield or Highway 28. At one time, the Blue Hills, as I mentioned, was a stagecoach stop. The uh, original Cornelius home, which was the head, Winds' headquarters during the Battle of the Short Hills, uh, stood about 100 yards behind where the Vermeule Mansion is today and about a mile and a half from the encampment. At its westernmost corner up here was Washington Rock. And this is just a more of a simple uh, streamlined map that we created. You can see the Stony Brook, you can see Stony Brook Pass, uh, you can see the Quibbletown Gap here. Uh, today, this is where the Vermeule Mansion is. This is where the Quibbletown encampment was. All this gray shaded area was Vermeule property, the totaling 1,200 acres. Uh, and then you can see the Green River, which runs uh, just north of the, of the Drake House. And here's the old Kings Highway or West Front Street going to Scotts Plains. And you can see the trip up to Washington Rock along that. And here is uh, the uh, an outline of Greenbrook Park uh, today, approximation. As the war dragged on, Washington increasingly relied on the New Jersey militia or Jersey men at the Blue Hills to wear down the British and eventually compel them to leave New Jersey. But we spoke disparagingly of the New Jersey militia at first. Thomas Paine called them summer soldiers because they were part-timers, leaving to plant in the spring and tend to the harvest in the fall. By the late spring of 1777, however, it was well known by Washington that any call to arms at the Blue Hills help came quickly. One who studies the history of the war can't help but be impressed with the important work of the New Jersey militia. The Jerseymen's performance to this day is highly regarded. It was a New Jersey militia along the back of the Blue Hills towards Springfield or over towards Connecticut Farms or Boundbrook that built and burned the beacon fires almost every night, warning of enemy approaches. The New Jersey militia or citizen soldiers continuously assembled and trained on the Vermeil farm from 1776 to 1780. The nucleus of the garrison numbered over 600 men, but fluctuated between one and 2,000 men, being half as large as Washington's 4,000 man Continental Army was during the winters of 76 and 77. New Jersey militia was relatively stronger than her line because no colony so badly needed a home guard so close to the bulk of the British Army in nearby New York. Cornelius Vermeule's younger sons, Frederick and J Cornelius Jr., were privates in the first Somerset Regiment of the New Jersey Militia. Eider's home uh, was east, as I had showed you on the earlier map, and since he was older, he became a lieutenant in the Essex County Militia. Adrian was not on the roster, as he was an aide to his father, a dispatch writer, and worked as a spy in the Committee of Observation. The Jersey men at the Blue Hills were mainly from Somerset, Middlesex, Morris, Essex, Hunterdon, and Sussex counties, General Wins's brigade. Wins had was initially, when they constructed the fort, was a colonel, but was later commissioned general in the spring of 77. A few companies of the 1st Somerset Mar um, Regiment of the New Jersey militia fought with Washington at the battles of Long Island, Trenton, Princeton, and Monmouth, including Colonel Derek Middaw, Jr. of Somerville, for which Middaw Street there is named, near the old Dutch parsonage. His daughter, Elizabeth Middaw, married Cornelius Vermeul, Jr., the speaker's four times paternal great-grandparents. The Jerseymen garrisoned at the Blue Hills were meant to guard the watch hung Lenape passes or gaps protecting the Continental Army. Many of the skirmishes were attempts by the British to penetrate American defenses by punching through these passes to get behind the ridges. 
These attacks were not successful, but their small raiding parties often caused havoc. One British incursion captured General Charles Lee, second in command of the Continental Army. He was caught sleeping in the tavern of Widow White near Morristown in what is today is known as Basking Ridge. The 1st Somerset Regiment had 1,500 soldiers out of a total population of 11,000, or nearly 14% of the population. Middlesex, with a population of 12,000, had 1,200 men of under arms, or nearly 10%. Of the Somerset white males over 16 years of age, 60% were under arms, and Middlesex over 40%. One would be hard pressed to find any county in the colonies that turned out a larger percentage of fighting age men than Somerset. Wynn's brigade at the Blue Hills went forth to fight several hot skirmishes in the winter and spring of 1777. Ash Swamp, Bonham Town, Piscataway, Quibble Town, where they destroyed David Coriel's farm, which is now Dunellen, um, Spank Town, which is now Rahway, and Van Ness Mills and Strawberry Hill, which is now Wed uh, Woodbridge. These skirmishes between January and June of 1777 culminated in the final climactic and fiercest forge war battle for control of New Jersey, the Battle of the Short Hills that took place around the Blue Hills campground. It seems incredible that this momentous event could unfold here in the North Plainfield area. The battle at one time was called the Battle of the Blue Hills. It could have been called the Battle of Edison, Scotch Plains, and Plainfield. It was a critical engagement during the Revolutionary War. William Alexander, or Lord Smith's Army, and New Jersey militia consisting of 2,500 Patriot farm boys held off the entire British Army of 16,000 veteran troops. The Short Hills, not to be confused with the town of Short Hills 10 miles away in Essex County, rise to the west of Oak Tree Road in Edison and reach the site of the present day Plainfield Country Club. These hills were appropriately named because they are low and inconspicuous compared to the first ridge of the Wachung Mountains that tower above them a few miles away. George Washington had several vantage points to view the action. Historians have identified nine Washington rocks along the first ridge. The rock at Greenbrook is the best known of these lookout posts. Others were located in Bridgewater and the Middlebrook Campground, Eagle Rock and West Orange and the South Mountain Reservation and other places. The sites rose between 400 and 500 feet above the Central Plains. They gave the American Army the advantage of getting an early warning that allowed time to plan tactics and strategy to stop the Redcoat invaders. When Washington was Washington really in what we uh, know as North Plainfield today? He had many reasons to be there. For starters, Wins and his officers made their headquarters at Cornelius Vermeule's homestead, which was located about 100 yards behind uh, the Vermeule mansion today. By June 1777, British forces had occupied New Jersey for seven months. During this time, General Howe, British General Howe had failed to lure Washington with the Continental Army down from their position in the Wachung Mountains. Howe decided it was time to move on. General Washington observed that Howe's forces were leaving New York. If you see down here, uh, Howe's forces were at Somerset Courthouse. That he, uh, Washington from the Rock, Middlebrook, had observed Howe leaving and going back towards. Perth Amboy to leave for New York from Somerset. He left uh, from the Eagle's Nest. That was the one uh, perch in uh, Middlebrook. This allowed the Continental Army to rescue Patriot citizens who were at risk of being massacred, having their homes plundered and their livestock stolen by the voracious Redcoat raiding parties from New Brunswick. Even today, you can see New Brunswick office buildings and, and Rutgers Stadium to the south from the Rock. Washington moved east from Middlebrook to continue observing, moved east from Middlebrook here, and he would ride his horse along the ridge of the Wachung to continue observing the British. He gazed down from his perch on a rock in Greenbrook, which was named Washington Rock about 60 years after the end of the war. It, Washington Rock provided a 60 mile panoramic view of the British occupied plains of central New Jersey. He could easily ride there along the crest of the ridge five miles from his base along the road, which is Route 22 today at Middlebrook and, Pound, and Boundbrook. Remnant, remnants of this trail are still visible today. Just below the rock uh, in North Plainfield 
was the camp. George Washington remained confident that the enemy was withdrawing uh, from Perth Anvoy, so he allowed the Jerseymen to return home. He could then confidently move the American forces down to the plains of Samptown, today South Plainfield. But the Short Hills Ash Swamp area, which you see here, Oh, well, my cursor is no longer working for some reason. Um, sorry about that. I don't know why it's not working. Okay, there we go. Do you see it? No, cursor is no longer working. Well, you can see the ash swamp on there, just uh, to the right of the Battle of the Short Hills. Um, excuse me. So, uh, Washington moved from Middlebrook East, nearby Patriot homes, including the uh, Drake House on Front Street, uh, provided a place where Washington could gather his staff. Cornelius's home was too public and busy with the mill. So looking west, he could see the secure route of Valley Road and Mountain View Boulevard below, where, as I mentioned and showed you on the map earlier, Cornelius's homestead was built and survives to this day. So he allowed the Jerseymen to return home. When the British learned, and so he came down from the hills to uh, the uh, headquarters, uh, and a spy that had was uh, uh, there had informed the uh, redcoats that Washington had come down out of the hills. So when the British learned that Washington had come down from the hills, they immediately reversed course, as you can see here, and I'm sorry if my cursor is no longer working. You can see, though, the, the, from the Perth Amboy, the reverse course back towards Metuchen, uh, and the same with Lord Cornwallis, who was second in command of the uh, uh, of the Redcoats, uh, back towards uh, Oak Tree. The movements, uh, so they immediately reversed course and began ferrying troops back from Staten Island to begin a surprise attack that could wipe out Lord Sterling and crush the vulnerable American army. Howe and Cornwallis moved their respective columns from Perth Amboy through Woodbridge and Metuchen in a pincer movement converging on Oak Tree. Washington sent orders directing the action during the Battle of the Short Hills in Plainfield via semaphore flag as a conflict raged on the ground of the present Plainfield Country Club, five miles to the west. The movements of enemy soldiers stirred clouds of dust clearly visible as they tried to outflank the Patriots. Plumes of smoke rose from burning farms nearby, the American cannon placement stretches from what is now the 4th to the 13th Greens at the Plainfield Country Club. The club grounds look west towards the first ridge of the Watchung, appearing exactly as it appeared during the war. Uh, you can, it, through uh, uh, binoculars or a looking glass, you can see uh, a Washington Rock. The trees uh, today obscure heavily populated town of Plainfield and Scotch Plains, which lie below. The cannon were lost and then retaken. Uh, massive volleys of British 12-pounder cannons hammered the Americans who fell back into Ash Swamp. They stubbornly resisted. Sterling's main force hid in the woods and continued harassing the British. The whole British army uh, was advancing towards the Blue Hills Post. The Continentals were greatly, the, the Continentals or the militia were greatly outnumbered six to one. Hundreds of militiamen responded to the alarm and converged to the Blue Hills. Uh, on tiptoe. It was an intensely hot day and many soldiers on both sides succumbed to the heat. Tensions ran high on the, for the Vermouls, their neighbors and their distinguished guests as cannons echoing in the distance were moving closer. Troops and officers scurried about while the wounded or dying were brought to the campground. General Howe's army continued foraging and plundering the locals, stoking further fear. Anxious mothers, wives, sisters feared the worst and prepared to flee with their children into the watch hung. Washington took advantage of this time when the British were mainly foraging to rapidly withdraw the army back to the high ground at Middlebrook, relying on Lord Sterling to slow the British advance along Oak Tree Road. Only the New Jersey militia was left to fight the enemy. Fierce fighting, including hand-to-hand -hand combat, drove the enemy back. The enemy was now Almost at the Blue Hills Fort, then from out of the blue came the feeling of victory. The Jerseymen drove the enemy back, unaided by Washington's main Continental Army, which had returned to Middlebrook. 
Jersey men were still pouring in from all around Somerset to join the fight. The Jersey men took heavy losses. The British broke off fighting and continued north to Westfield. Again, apologies for my cursor not working, but you can see the, the, the arrow going back up to Westfield uh, for the British withdrawal. Um, they spent the night pillaging and destroying the town of, uh, of Westfield uh, on, and, uh, and continuing to move on, uh, withdrawing towards Rawway and Woodbridge. The battered Americans retreated through the gap in the Watchung Mountains in Scotch Plains uh, and to get behind the first ridge. A British officer counted 37 American wagons filled with wounded and dying soldiers struggling up the long winding hill on Bo Bonnie Burn Road past the Colorado Cafe. Past the site of the, I'm not sure if the Colorado Cafe is still there or not. For many years, the road was known as Bloody Gap. Sterling's men then trudged down Valley Road through Watchung and continued down Mountain Boulevard in Warren before turning east on Morning Glory Road to reach Middlebrook. Sterling alerted the main American army in time for them to orderly withdraw to the high ground at Middlebrook and avoid a major battle, one that surely would have ended the War of Independence with an American defeat and a capture of George Washington. Years later, on June 24th, uh, 20, 25th, 2017, on the 240th anniversary, the history of this momentous event was brought to life at Oak Ridge Park in Clark, just one mile from where the battle took place. Hundreds gathered to reenact the Battle of the Short Hills. Though a tactical defeat for the colonials, it was a small triumph for the British. However, it diverted them from their primary campaign objective, which was to defeat the main Continental Army. It was a significant strategic victory of the Revolutionary War because it gave Washington time to withdraw his forces to fight another day. It also degraded Howe's forces. Howe was now forced to take the Chesapeake route from Perth Amboy to Arthur, uh, uh, to Arthur Kill Staten Island via ship to begin the Philadelphia campaign leaving New Jersey. This abandonment of New Jersey would allow the Patriots to reoccupy this Tory infested land. The Battle of the Short Hills was one of the last great struggles for New Jersey, largely forgotten compared to spring, the battles of Springfield and Monmouth, but critical to the war's success. The Battle of Short Hills also marked a few firsts in the Revolutionary War history. The Betsy Ross flag had just been adopted by the Congress. The Continental Congress on June 14th may have been flown in battle for the first time. And also the British used uh, a breech uh, Ferguson rifles, which were uh, six shot breech loaded uh, rifles. Um, uh, very, uh, there, there weren't many of them because they were very uh, expensive and, and hard to manufacture. Uh, French commanders and brass cannons were used on behalf of the Americans and chemical warfare was used on both sides via poisoned bullets and musket balls dipped in fungus. Uh, French formal involvement or declaration wouldn't come until February of 1778 after victory at the Battle of Ticonderoga. Uh, the other interesting uh, tidbit is that uh, General, the young French General Lafayette was also with Washington on Washington Rock uh, during the battle. This is a, a, a picture at the end of the battle and the, and the retreat by, of Howe's army uh, in uh, Perth Amboy to Fresh Kill. Wa at Washington, uh, and this is a local artist uh, uh, painted uh, by uh, Kevin McDonald, local New Jersey artist. Um, Washington was again on the large outcropping of rock now that everything was in control at the Vermouths below. Um, the, the Raritan Valley would soon be devoid of redcoats, at least temporarily. Standing on the rock, uh, uh, Washington last glimpse through his looking glass, as depicted by McDonald, an armada of 270 enemy ships setting sail from Perth Amboy on June 30th, 1777, to begin the Philadelphia camp campaign. Most North Plainfield area residents have visited this scenic 52-acre Washington Rock State Park, or at least know about it. The rock has a long and colorful history. It became, not long after the war in the early 1800s, it became a popular tourist attraction. Nearly 2,500 Re area residents visited the rock on July 4th, 1831 to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the end of the war. And to accommodate the influx of travelers, a road called Cardinal Lane was constructed for stagecoaches to shuttle tourists between the Plainfield 
uh, uh, railway station in Washington Rock. Cardinal Lane remains today as an unpaved hiking trail that was destroyed and permanently shut after Hurricane Sandy. It may have reopened, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, daily stagecoach service costs 50 cents round trip. The uh, one of the things that when Washington had stayed up on the rock during the battle uh, for those four or five days with Lafayette, the top of the watch hung had many freshwater springs that emptied into the Green River. In 1890, the local uh, a local family, the Berliner family, had the foresight to buy acreage in Washington Rock State Park or in the area, it wasn't a state park yet, on the west side of what is now Rock Road East and established a dis and to distribute bottled water from nearby wellheads. The Blenners formed the Watchung Spring Water Bottling Company in 1890 and commenced operations on two productive wellheads on the property, marking in it to be the same spring water that Washington drank from during the war. Many of the bottles produced had raised lettering saying Washington Rock Spring Water. The rock was promoted by the Berliners as a spiritual revolutionary war elixir, a co-star of the post-war 19th century glamorization of the Revolutionary War New Jersey. For over 10 years, they, were, they filled small and large bottles, but eventually the, uh, the well uh, ran dry. This is a picture of the Ferguson rifle I was talking about as one of the first breech loading rifles to be put into service by the British military. It fired a standard British carbine ball, a 61 caliber and was used by the British army. Uh, also uh, known to have been used by the British army in Saratoga. And we think it was tested at the Battle of the Short Hills. It had superior firepower and was, but was unappreciated at the time because it, as I said, it was too expensive and took too long to produce took four gunsmiths to make one rifle. So it's very, very complex. Here's the, I mentioned the Betsy Ross flag, uh, formally commissioned by Congress in June of 1777, just before the Battle of the Short Hills. Uh, it had 13 stripes and 13 stars, uh, white and a blue field representing a new constellation for the 13 colonies. Washington uh, flew this rock at his middle, flew this flag at uh, his Middlebrook encampment. Here is a picture of um, the Rock, but also the Rock House Hotel. It's called the Washington Rock Mountain House Hotel or Rock House Hotel in uh, 1859. The, the Rock House Hotel had burned in the 1800s and it was uh, never rebuilt. And this, I mentioned that Lafayette was on the Rock with uh, George Washington during the Battle of Short Hills. Um, this little, the smaller rock uh, to the south or below the larger outcropping, which is Washington Rock, is known as Lafayette Rock today because that's where Lafayette would would sit and uh, 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 dangle his, his uh, feet, his neatly leather clad feet over the edge while Washington was watching uh, the battles below. And this picture was done by uh, uh, Charles uh, Wilson Peel. Um, who uh, was a well-known uh, artist uh, at the time who traveled with Washington and, and did many uh, sketches. He also has done some famous oil paintings of Washington that hang in various museums in the country. And this is a, the Peel sketch closer up of Washington Rock during the Battle of the Short Hills. And Peel included himself in this um, in this rock, in this uh, portrait, he was a he was the pro prolific portraitist of his era. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, here's a couple of pictures of a couple of the Washington Rock Spring Water uh, bottles. They were they're pretty heavy, pretty pretty stout bottles, uh, and uh, and there were many different types of bottles uh, that were made during the production uh, over the course of the the ten years. So. The history of the old campground was not yet complete, however. Uh, in August uh, 1781, the American army thundered by the Blue Hills Post on its way to final victory at Yorktown. For two days, regiments with artillery and equipment, including 30 flatboats, passed on through Boundbrook, Millstone, and Princeton. Um, the, uh, 
Battle of the Short Hills uh, had earned Washington the respect of Lord Cornwallis. Four years after the battle, Cornwallis surrendered at Yorktown. Cornwallis said, but after all your, quote, but after all your excellency's achievement in New Jersey were such that nothing could surpass, could, could surpass them. Cornelius Vermeul, aged by the struggle and the death of his eldest son, Adrian, survived the final roll call of Washington's army by only four months, dying March 1784. He will forever be remembered as the owner of this very important and large area of land in colonial America that was converted into a revolutionary campground in the Raritan Valley where there was a fort and a large garrison of militiamen that helped repel the British from New Jersey and win the Revolutionary War. But the history of the campground was not complete. The government purchased 85 acres at $50 an acre that came with the fort from Captain Cornelius Vermeule in 1799 in preparation for a cantonment at the Blue Hills for the quasi-war with France, which as uh, Sarah uh, mentioned earlier, Ryan from uh, uh, Monmouth will be uh, presenting more information. Uh, Ryan, Rett, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name either. We'll be uh, doing a presentation later uh, for the library. Uh, the war only lasted two years from 1798 to 1800. Uh, George Washington remembered the militia post in the Vermeule homestead and suggested to then President John Adams to set up a cantonment there. It was only 20 miles from Perth Amboy. His daughter, uh, uh, his daughter, John Adams, his daughter, Abigail, who had the same name as uh, Abigail, the mother, first lady, was married to Captain William Smith, who was commandant of the camp. Uh, Abigail and Smith lived there uh, in Plainfield. Uh, uh, the, uh, and we, we think possibly at the home of Eider Bermool. We're not sure. We're, that's part of our research. But we also know from letters that Nancy Peebleware has discovered uh, in the Adams family uh, archives that the First Lady Abigail visited them in Plainfield uh, and, uh, and visited her, her daughter Abigail. And second, President John Adams put retired George Washington in command of the army. Uh, the camp there uh, was called the Union Camp. And uh, as I'd said, he recalled um, the uh, Vermeule Post uh, during the Revolutionary War, and he wanted to locate it there. But the Blue Hills saw no action as the war was almost fought entirely at sea. Uh, deeds are recorded in the congressional record and executed by Alexander Hamilton. And um, in 1816, uh, Cornelius Vermeule Jr. repurchased the remainder of the campground at $70 an acre. Uh, he willingly overpaid due to the strong sentimental value he placed on the old camp. He renamed his repurchased plantation in North Plainfield, Warren Plains, after General Joseph Warren, a famous patriot from Boston and surgeon who killed at the Battle of Bunker Hill. He also named one of his sons Warren, brother to my three times great grandmother. Warren Plains is located in Greenbrook Township now, but was within the boundary of Warren Township in the 1800s. <clears throat> Cornelius Vermeule Jr. was commissioned captain in 1823, shortly before his death in 1824. Uh, shortly before his death, there was a parade and speeches by his officers on the campground at his retirement celebration. He gave a speech honoring the brave compatriots, including Joseph Warren that died at Bunker Hill. His wife, Elizabeth, collected a higher pension, as uh, you may or may not know that the higher your rank in the military, the, the larger your pension was, and Elizabeth uh, Vermeul. So he was commissioned, somehow he was commissioned a captain from private uh, prior to his death. And so she received a larger pension uh, and that she got in, uh, started receiving in 1833. I think it was $4 a month. Um, but anyway, what was interesting in looking at some of these pension records at the David Library at Washington Crossing, which is now in the Philosophical Museum that Benjamin Franklin uh, started in uh, Philadelphia, uh, in these pension records, it, it showed uh, many, many older men who were veterans married to young uh, women who became 20-something, 30-something widows. But if they married these women and these veterans didn't have families, the widows were able to receive the pensions of their, uh, of their husbands. I thought that was a, kind of an interesting anecdote. And finally, 
Um, here's a, here's a, uh, the original plaque it was on a rock in Greenbrook Park. It was stolen about 12 or 14 years ago. Uh, it was erected by the Continental Chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution in 1924. Uh, my uh, distant cousin Cornelius C., the map maker, uh, who was a historian engineer uh, who drew those battlegrounds, uh, he gave a speech uh, for the uh, uh, put uh, the uh, establishment of this this pack uh, of this plaque, and it says it's in, erected in memory of the brave revolutionary soldiers from the vicinity who garrisoned this fort, harassing and repulsing the invading enemy for seven months during the darkest period of the war from this outpost on June 26, 1777. <clears throat> the plaque was stolen and uh, uh, much to our surprise, Rich Palmetier uh, had recreated. Now this plaque was originally extremely heavy uh, and uh, there were a, a lot of these types of markers, historical markers that were made 100 years ago of, of brass that were stolen uh, and no doubt melted down uh, somehow. But uh, uh, Rich recreated uh, this plaque uh, and a different, not in brass and another format. And it's now back uh, in the park so you can see it. Uh, and uh, kudos to uh, Rich uh, Palmatier of Union County for, uh, for doing this. Thank you, Rich. And that is all, my friends. Thank you very much for uh, listening and, and uh, look forward to your participation and to uh, maybe meeting you all someday in the not too distant future. Yeah, now this blown up picture, you can see the, the signage in the, uh, in the park that shows the Battle of the Short Hills and the cannon. And the uh, Green River there is hidden by those, the Green Brook is hidden by those tall hedges. But I've walked along the bank and, uh, and at the con uh, confluence of the Stony Brook came out of the pass. It's a, it's a worthwhile uh, little, little walk if uh, you've not uh, done it today. Oh, John, thank you so much. Um, that was so fascinating. Um, uh, before we uh, move on to the Q&A, we actually have uh, our special guest panelists join us. Uh, Rich Pomptier is here. Uh, he is gonna share uh, some of those really cool map overlays that you mentioned in your program. Mm -hmm. uh, Rich, if you wanna unmute and we can, we can get your slides going. Can you still hear me? We can, yep. Okay, I was gonna ask Rich if, uh, if I'm assuming he can hear me that, uh, but would like to know what the materials was he used for the new plaque. Okay. Hey John, okay. Uh, Rich, Rich Palmatier. Uh, I'm now with the Office of Cultural and Heritage Affairs in Union County, but uh, for decades, I drove up and down Inman Avenue four times a day between work and home, following the route accidentally of the uh, Battle of the Short Hills. So I'm kind of familiar with where they would have hidden and fought. Uh, the, the plaque itself, the replacement is uh, fiberglass reinforced plastic with aluminum, I, I wanna use the word, um, it just applied to the back. It will probably only last about 40 years. So someone <laughs> will have to come up with a better by then they'll have 3D printing that's worthwhile. Uh, but if you go by it, it looks pretty good unless you go up and try and feel it. And anyone who wants to steal it is gonna be disappointed because it's plastic. It just looks yeah. good. Uh, so if I, can I share my screen? Uh, you certainly can. Um, John, if you wanna stop your screen share. Uh... Okay. I, I, I have a couple of things that I, I should have broken in when John was talking, but. I'm do I have to do new share here? No, or? he, uh, uh, Rich should be able to just jump right in. Uh, okay. Rich, you can, if you want to do your video, you can too. Uh, well, I, I'm going to stop you, it says here. Okay. That's fine. Okay. You should uh, do that, yeah. You're going to stop me or you're going to stop Sarah, okay. right? Okay. Now you should be seeing the um, yep. Guillermo Thorne stereograph. Does that sound right? Yep. Great. I see it. 
Okay, now this is the um, image I think you showed earlier. I was I had network problems and I was traveling to another location, so I'm kind of hurried and mad at Comcast because they turned off my network when I needed it. Uh, this is a stereograph of the view from Washington Rock, and if you don't know what that looks like, this is what it looks like today off Google. Uh, but in the 30s. Can you see my mouse? Yeah. OK, yeah. this is the area below Washington Rock up top here. This is the area in that stereograph. And if you enlarge the image there, off on the left, we see some of the homes that you had mentioned, uh, including what may be your family's homestead mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in this image. Uh, it comes out much better. And um, the possibly the stage house, we're still debating some of this, whether that's showing. This is the 1870s, late 1880s, this photograph. And finally downstream below the rock, this other home, which still exists there, right off Greenbrook Road. Uh, does anyone have a name for that house or no? It, um, the, the, the biggest one in this picture? Let's go back. This this looks like your homestead. Just to jump, this is this area enlarged. Yep. So those are in case you wanted to see what it looked like. And I'm sorry, I've got to jump around because I'm not in my desk. Uh, the next additional thing which we're going to help with is going to be, can I share? Can you see? A, green and white with dark lines over it no okay uh, i'm gonna stop sharing and then reshare again sorry okay how about now yes okay uh i'm also a big fan of erskine robert erskine washington's cartographer and i've taken most of his images of union county and overlaid them over an early 1900s topographical map and this is Inman Avenue. If you see my mouse moving up and down Inman Avenue. Um, yes. At the top, this is where the battle took place, which is now the Plainfield Country Club. And I can't enlarge, yeah, I guess I can. Uh, but that's where the battle mostly took place. And here we have Ash Schwamp off to the side, Gershom Frazee's house. And this is two bridges. To help John's area, if you go upstream and over toward Plainfield, you can see here we are, the area that we're talking about with the camp. And um, here's Quibbletown down below in this area. And then this is the Front Street area. And at that point, and on Erskine's wonderfully detailed maps, Front Street took a side trip off underneath the train tracks today, which was very good information when trying to locate the uh, camp and the later fort, which I'm going to try and stop and go again to the screen shares to go to the next step. Sorry about this jumpiness. Uh, okay, but in using John's maps, and it was from his family, I believe. In the 1790s, there was a lot of information about the later camp on that area, on the same spot. And these are from the Library of Congress. This is a sketch of what the buildings look like, some letters. Uh, and of course, I turned them into modern drawings. But the actual regiments themselves were laid out in maps of what the later 1790s campground, which was on the same spot that the Battle of the Short Hills encampment was, was laid out with detailed drawings and detailed measurements, which you can then take and of course turn into a computer image that makes it a little bit better to see. And then you can put it on the topographical map of the area. And you have a, a encampment this big that fairly much can only be where I've placed it now. 
it could be over a little bit this way or it could be over a little bit that way, but it couldn't be in the valley because it's level ground and it's this length of footage and it's aligned north and south as detailed on the maps. So this somewhere, in this, somewhere in this area is where the later fort had to be based on its dimensions. And the encampment was the same place in the fort. So we're basically saying somewhere along the edge of Greenbrook Park, Drake House is over here, and you've got this small section of property, which, which is where Nancy has said it is ever since I've known her. So you're pretty much going to be there. And this was all on uh, Vermeer land. Yes, yes. This whole area was yeah. Vermeer land. And that's it for fancy pictures from me at the moment. Uh, I'm going to stop to sharing. be continued. Go back to you guys. Thanks, Rich. Okay, where well, you are. I, I love those map. I, I, you know, I, I absolutely love the map overlays, the historical um, map overlays. I've got. Uh, the, Nancy, oh, sorry. That's all right. I've got the whole county, but we don't have six hours, so we're going to jump away. We will do that <laughs> another time. Uh, Nancy, Nancy has a uh, her announcement. So we have your Nancy got your slide up already. Yes. Yes. This is. This is where the proximity where I think the encampment of the fort was um, down the center of Compton Avenue. I've tried to reach out to um, Compton family members, but I have been unsuccessful. Um, there was a hill. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but there was a hill here called Row Cap Hill. When they straightened out the road, they probably took down part of the hill from records that I've seen. And with Rich's dimensions um, and what he just showed, this is the proximate area I believe that the fort was in. Because, um, whoops, oh, let me go back. One, go back. Okay, uh, up above um, to the north was a well that still exists. It was a spring in Greenbrook Park. And, um, and you can see my notations, but that's where I think it is. And the thing that I just found last night was um, in a quartermaster book that um, Rich P had found for me, um, and I've been trying to transcribe the different sections from the quasi war. Um, I actually found last night the name of the man who drafted the deed for the United States. It was W. Chetwood, and T. Still was a surveyor that um, surveyed the land for the cantonment, and Ogden, Aaron Ogden was the clerk of the county who recorded the deed. So that was pretty neat to find that. But, but and you Ogden can, went on to become uh, governor of New Jersey, didn't he? Right, I believe so, yes. Yeah. And you could see that in this record also, which I had seen before, but I had never really recognized the man's name for the deed in the surveying. Um, you can see it talked about the Union Brigade and the 11th and the 12th Regiment. And they also talked about building a hospital for the huts and during COVID, as Rich said, I was looking up all kinds of articles. Old man Compton who owned the land where I think the fort was, he reported in the newspaper accounts that um, he would keep finding bones. And we, th I believe that there's at least, according to his newspaper account, there's 30 to 40 soldiers that are buried somewhere on the hill in, in Greenbrook Park on Myrtle Avenue. Which so one amazing. of these one of these huts or buildings is where uh, field officers, staff officers, right. would have the, the rich showed is where uh, what Captain William Smith and Abigail Adams would have stayed. Right, right. So they actually did build hospital huts and things because men were getting sick, and so, and and we actually know that it's true because I took a ride just before COVID up to. Marstown historical um, site and they have an archives there and I actually found a diary of one of the men that said that there was somebody buried so unfortunately we don't know where they're buried, but there is primary source documentation that at least one person was buried uh, mm -hmm. in the area. I'll stop sharing now Sarah. That's a, that's a great document. Yeah. <laughs> 